Well, I came prepared with a huge long list of questions because how often do we get the chance to pick Blizzard's brains, right? <laughs> um, but I guess we should start off by asking each of you to, because so many of you, we need to find out who you each are. So maybe we start right here with you, John, and tell everybody who you are. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, so I'm John Hyde. I'm the general manager of the Warcraft franchise, and I've been making games about 30 years. So uh, great to be back here at DICE. Hi, I'm Holly Longdale. I'm the executive producer of World of Warcraft. Uh, might be relevant for this conversation. I was also the former head of the EverQuest franchise. There you, go. One, you have one fan, Holly. You have one. Uh, it's more than I have, so you're good. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Rod Ferguson, and I'm the general manager of Diablo, and probably in the context as well, I used to head up Gears of War. Hi, and I'm Lydia Bottagoni, and I oversee a um, team at Blizzard called Story and Franchise Development. We're the, the transmedia group, so I'm not the industry veteran that all of these are. I'm a bit of a newcomer to the game world, but I um, come from 20 plus years of uh, filmmaking. Hi, I'm uh, Alan Adham. I'm one of the co-founders. I talked to my friends Mike and Frank at UCLA into coming along on this crazy ride. Um, today, I, uh, my day job is Chief Design Officer at Blizzard. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. We've got quite a crew here. So, you know, I, it, the, the session and all of DICE this year is about the long haul, right? So, uh, I guess that means I start with you, Alan. <laughs> Ooh, <burn. laughs> You've been here since the beginning, right? That was a burn. Does that make me the old guy on stage? Let's start with the yeah. oldest guy on the <laughs> yeah. panel. Still young at heart. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things about this, uh, this whole discussion, right, I'd love to find takeaways that uh, folks who aren't Blizzard can use, right? So I, I want to rewind. Talk to me about the early days of Blizzard and how you set about, you know, building franchises that would come to dominate the industry, right? Because everybody else here is jealous and, and wants to know. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for starters, this is one of my favorite things to do, is to tell stories about the good old days. So um, people know Blizzard today, and our, uh, our IPs are pretty well known. But if you go back far enough in time, we were a little indie developer. No one knew who Blizzard was. We weren't even called Blizzard back then. We were called Silicon and Synapse. By the way, terrible name, if you're thinking of naming your company, pick something easy to remember and easy to spell. No one knew what that meant or how to spell it. But in the early days, um, we made some pretty good games. Um, say, Lost Vikings won Puzzle Game of the Year. Um, Rock and Roll Racing, Racing Game of the Year. Um, Blackthorn. But none of those really sort of changed the world for us. Um, Great games, but they didn't really break through. That didn't happen for us until kind of Warcraft 1 set the stage for Warcraft 2. And one of the things we were dealing with back then, it's similar today, discoverability, right? How do you, if, if people don't already know your games and you don't have big ad budgets, how do you break through and get somebody to, back then for us pick your box off the shelf. Today it's the same thing, it's metaphorical, but still, pick your box off the shelf. And so, if you think about what buying a game was back then, it was this chaotic mess of boxes on different platforms. There were usually board games up there too, D&D &D modules. And how do you get somebody that's scanning all this product to pick your thing off the shelf? And so, one of the things that motivated us was um, not directly related to IP, but the reason all of our boxes for many years had these big giant heads on them was this, um, this Infocom box cover. Uh, it was a game called Suspended. It was this big white Great face, game. right? And so if you were looking at, at these boxes and this giant white face was staring back at you, you almost couldn't help but like, what is that giant white face? So all our early games, you know, uh, you know Warcraft uh, has the two big heads, and we just keep making them bigger and bigger. At Warcraft 3, they don't even fit on the box anymore. We had to do four different boxes to get the four races. But um, 
Along with that was an understanding that because we wanted the breakthrough quickly, we needed to pick something that would deeply emotionally connect with our, our potential players. So it wasn't enough just to have a big face on the box, but ideally it was something that people would, in a few seconds, understand and love. And so when we came out with Warcraft 1, it was based on the sort of uh, token lore, high fantasy. We didn't want to pay for an IP. There's financial considerations with that. It also can limit your creativity in terms of building long-term value. We knew we wanted to build our own IPs. And so we tapped in, and we, we teach this at Blizzard, tap into a common folklore, and then make it your own. And by doing that, you have an IP without you know, paying for an IP. And so whether it's orcs or night elves or dwarves, um, our Warcraft IP and the characters, the classes, and the, and the spells, they're the kind of thing that um, players can get very quickly. They understand, and if they love that, deeply connects. We get them in a few seconds. StarCraft is similar. If you think about the most common tropes in high science fiction, StarCraft is the space marine, and we called him a space marine. We could have called him something else, but we called him the space marine. Um, the bugs from Starship Troopers or uh, aliens, or, um, um, the very common kind of recurring trope there too. And the last one illustrates another point, which is you just don't want to be on the nose all the time, but I'll borrow from Sid Meier, a third, a third, a third. So maybe in our case with IP development, kind of a third on the nose, a third improved, and a third new. So if you look at the Protoss in StarCraft, most people don't realize, see a hand up back there, thank you. Um, <laughs> most people don't realize that the Protoss are actually derived from the Roswell aliens um, and also inspired by kind of the samurai culture. So the Roswell aliens, the bug-eyed telepaths, you know, kind of no mouth, that's our version of taking a common trope but then putting our spin on it. But we only do that after we've established that core, and we get that with, you know, our space marines and, um, and the bugs. Uh, real quick, Diablo, maybe the best known folklore of all, um, the Bible. And so Diablo's not uh, a direct take on the Bible, but it's biblical in tone. And then Overwatch is um, based on superheroes, whether it's Marvel or Justice League. Um, that's kind of the inspiration for that and our version there. And so while we don't make box covers anymore, it's a similar problem today. Discoverability and your first look often is your announced cinematic. And so you can think of, you know, somebody just overwhelmed with media. If you can get them to fall in love with your IP instantaneously in a couple minutes in your announced cinematic, then now you've got them looking at your game and then you also have to make a great game. So that, that sounds like a perfect segue to Lydia. Uh, Lydia, you came over from film. And, uh, I mean, we just heard Alan name a whole bunch of movies and sort of talk about, I guess, modern mythology. Um, which is, you know, I hear that thrown around with Marvel movies and, and the like. I, how did you make the jump from film to Blizzard? And uh, you know, it seems like there's a pretty common thread there. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, like all things um, at Blizzard, there's legacy, there's history, people like Alan, people like Chris Metzen, um, what they gave us, the, the veterans of, of the company, they gave us these amazing worlds to play in, right? So um, these deep, rich worlds with these amazing characters. And for me, that was the hook. I come from an industry where storytelling and um, deep and lasting universes are what, you know, that's gold, that's, that's what you always wanna find and Blizzard just seemed to have this embarrassment of riches in, in that regard. Um, and then the characters, the thing that I don't know if we talk about enough, um, Alan touched on it a little bit, um, but a game like Overwatch, you think about a game like Overwatch and what an incredible, fantastic, just diverse lineup of characters, right? And at its core, it's a first person shooter, but there is this amazing lineup of characters. I think there's an amazing diverse lineup of female characters as well, which is also pretty awesome. Um, and for my team, the, the 
narrative team, um, it's this storytelling opportunity. We have this opportunity, all the characters have different design, different play styles, different abilities, and for us, each of those is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to tell more story. It's an opportunity, I hope, for us to make those characters relatable to people. I think that's a lot of what draws people in to a franchise like Overwatch. Again, there's not narrative in the game, um, and these characters don't have a lot of stories, per se, when you play them. But what we're trying to do is make these characters relatable, make them interesting. Um, for me, it's been kind of an embarrassment of riches, I will say. It's, it's fun. Um, I think that's the challenge also. There's so much um, potential material there. There's so many opportunities. Figuring out who, who we're going to work with, what um, character we're going to develop, what stories we're going to tell, and having to make some hard choices is probably the thing that is the biggest struggle. It was, for me in general, the struggle coming to Blizzard was, there's so much. What do you, you know, what do you do with it? How do you make those choices? But yeah, it, it's been really, really fun. Now, of course, these, these franchises, these stories, they last a really long time. Um, you know, uh, like my, my first big game just celebrated 25 years of continuous operation, right? Um, Ultima Online. And these, these games as a service last and last and last, right? How do you go about designing for that kind of longevity and pre-planning the storytelling even so that it has room for that kind of longevity and, and stays fresh? How, how, how do you do that? How do you build ongoing relevance into it? Um, Rod? Yeah. Well, I mean, for us, like, one of the things we really brought to attempt to do at Gears of War was really around the idea of um, creating negative space that we found that one of the tricks you can run into in trying to build an IP and like, oh, we need a Bible, a story Bible, we need all this documentation and you're really sort of, there's a lot of pressure to figure it all out. And we just realized that in the room when we're trying to get a game made, we're not necessarily the smartest people to know everything about every part of the universe. And our biggest example is um, in Gears of War 1, there's a helicopter ride where Marcus is freed from prison and they go, are you Marcus Phoenix, the, the hero of the Battle of Asheville Field? And he goes, yeah. And we had no idea what the Battle of Asheville Field was. We had no, all we knew was that Marcus was there and apparently he was the hero of it. And that's all we knew. And we were like, sure, we could sit here in this conference room for, for days and plot out every aspect of that battle. That's not valuable to us in this moment and for the game. We just need to know that backstory. So when Karen Travis came in as a novelist, she was trying to find out like, what stories can I tell in your world? And we were, what about the Battle of Asheville Fields? And she goes, well, that sounds great. What happened? And we were like, no idea. Um, so it's yours to go play with. And, and the ability to create those hooks for new creatives to come in, we've had that happen in comic books, on novels, and even in the, the sequels, is you get new people coming in with new ideas and fresh things that allow you to expand your universe in a way that you weren't expecting. So like, I, I would really recommend that it, unless you absolutely need to know it, don't nail it down, because you're, all you're doing actually is just ca causing constraints that stop you from being more creative later. Yeah, I mean, for us, part of it is uh, maintaining some amount of relevance, and just like Rod said, when we are developing a story arc, we come up with those ideas, but how we achieve relevance is that those arcs get delivered to the teams, and you can see sort of art imitating life. The topics, the quests, the content they come up with is quite often a reflective reflection of what we're all experiencing. So we found, you know, in Shadowlands, uh, the expansion prior to the one that came out recently, it had a more darker tone. It was sort of uh, alongside COVID and it was sort of, it, you could feel, uh, you know, sorrow and, um, and also hope. And then we got to Dragonflight, which was, you know, very much like we've had enough of, you know, experiencing that sort of a more morose tone. And now we have this wonderful experience that's all about hope and achievement and beauty. And I think that resonates with our community and they tell us that's what we wanted. You know, it's relevant to us in the moment. And I think that's something um, to, to pay some attention to. Now, the, uh, what about things like uh, WoW Classic and circling back? to earlier parts of the game's history, because that's also something that's a thing, right? Yeah, I mean, the nostalgia business is a really interesting uh, event that I'm sure a lot of people even here have experienced. And that is very much an ear to the ground when we're talking about remaining relevant and ensuring you last long term. 
is make sure you're listening, keep your ear to the ground, and there is, we, I'm sure we would all love to know what that trigger is that makes something meaningfully nostalgic. Um, but we did listen, um, and it was started as a, it was almost like a, a project, like a small project. Um, and when it was released, it was just explosive. It was not expected uh, how it rung true around the world uh, for people. But that was very much a staying true to what classic was, reliving what it was, um, and also evolving what it was based on, on the community itself. So again, you know, if you want to build a long-lasting business, it's driven mostly by your fans and by the community. Yeah, I want to make one point about it because I think it's really fascinating for me about Classic is that through the course of World of Warcraft, which we're, we're going to be on 19 years now, we're not quite up, caught up with you. I started <laughs> playing UO, so thank you so much for getting me into this. Um, but in the creation of Classic, it was kind of a love letter to our fans, and we were very worried, you know, about would people be okay with, you know, not having all the conveniences that we provide in modern WoW today. And I think that our audience over time has asked for those. It's like, oh, you know, why do you make me, you know, schlep all the way over here? Can I just summon my friends here? QOL. You know, you know it, all, all the quality of life improvements. Yeah, I do, you know, I don't want to find a group. Just find one for me. And yet, that friction created a camaraderie amongst the players. And I think when people re-experience that in Classic, I remember when we first fired it up and, and watching people all line up in a, in a uniform queue to do the one thing that only one person could do at a time before moving on. And they were so polite. And it's like, wow, I wish modern society was like this. You know, has it really changed that much in, in 16 years? But yeah. And it's also, too, that the communities are different. There's very little crossover. So we've welcomed back a series of new uh, and existing fans that may have left us in the past. So we have now serving two very unique communities. I think the authenticity of that is what's important, too. Like, we were talking about, like, things that last decades, there's an expectation that maybe there's some modernization, but ultimately they want to be an authentic. Like, when we did Diablo II Resurrected, it was, we're going to redo every cutscene. Um, but it has to be true to the story and true to the intent and kind of be like what it would have, you know, if you make that game today, what could you do with it? And so, but it was very important that it's the same engine running underneath. It's the same game because we, we want the players to have that same experience, but we wanted to freshen it up. So, but authenticity is important there. Yeah, players really invest into this, right? Like that's, that's the big thing. They, they move in. Right, you're, you're, you're building the house <laughs> and, and well, I mean, you built the furniture, you built everything really, but, but they still make it their own, right? They, they still feel like, hey, I inhabit this space. And I guess over the years, it, it does become different spaces as it accrues history, QOL features, <laughs> whatever. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious though, if, if, if they inhabit it, how much of it is yours, and how much of it is theirs? Oh, I, 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 I got to take that question. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, because, you know, especially where we've been operating as a live service, as you know, and, and the moment that the doors open, they stay open, you know, 24-7. And our players are deeply invested in the game. And, and I've noticed that over the course of time, over the last 15 years, more and more, you know, people are taking to the forums or taking to social media to tell you all the things that they wish you would do in the game and, and the things they love, the things they hate. You know, we have marriages in the game. We have marriages that occur as, as a result of people meeting in the game. People have tattoos, you know, uh, you know, from our game and, you know, guilds that meet, you know, they're lifelong friends together. And, you know, I have, you know, my own boys, you know, I, they started playing, we still play to, together and raid together in WoW. And so we've gone a full you know, generation in it and, it, and it's become a lifestyle. And it, what's really crazy for us is we, we realize we're the caretakers of this sort of cultural thing for people. You know, it's deeper than telling a single story. It's deeper than just expressing our own ideas and creativity. It's fulfilling a lot of the fantasy and dreams that our players have. And that's, that's a daunting person, uh, responsibility. And I'll say too, as probably most everyone knows, as soon as you craft this uh, lovingly, this game, and you hand it out to the community, it's no longer yours. It belongs to them. 
and I think for us, we view it that way. We're, we also have the benefit of the, I would say, all, all if not, uh, I'm going to say all. It feels like all of our team plays the game as well. And so there's this symbiotic relationship that forms where we're constantly listening. And so I, I refer to it to listen, learn, and ultimately let go. So what that means is, you know, we create the guidelines, the framework, and the behavior we want, and how to discourage the be behavior we don't. And they develop, especially for us in WOW, social connect connections and community are the lifeblood. It's what kept us around for so long. So we pay very close attention to that. And sometimes those guidelines and rules that you make, you have to bend them a little bit. And then you do the evaluation. The learning part is we have the benefit these days to be able to look at data and see what they're doing so we can hear what they're saying, actually dig into it and find out the actual truth of it and then serve them, give them what they need. And a lot of times that means letting go, letting go of a presumption, a design that you loved and adjusting it for fun, for their benefit. And an example of that, even while classic, was we're, we're, we called it hashtag no changes, wow classic. We even put code in to make the combat feel like it did in 2004. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, uh, they weren't big fans of that. Um, so, you know, we made adjustments and now we're kind of hashtag some changes and it's like quality of life. It's things that seemed fine <laughs> when you're nostalgic, but when you're actually playing the game, they've evolved so much and they, it's a game they played before in a lot of cases. And so there's things we had to figure out and adjust. So again, it's just sort of that listen, learn and let go. And, and yeah, you, I see. Yeah, you, you mentioned, uh, and you know, sometimes we bend it a little bit, and narratively, for sure, when we bend it too much, we know, we we <laughs> we hear, we we definitely are told when we've crossed a line. So, how do you then prioritize? Right, you you're you're like, you're basically the almost like the government of a small country, right? <laughs> like, how how do you prioritize? the stories that you want to tell, the things you hear from your audience says, because even with like classic audience, as you just said, is not the same as, as main wow and so on. How, how do you prioritize all of these things and the desires of the dev team, right? How do you, how do you juggle that? How do you make cho tough choices, right? Because even you don't have infinite resources. I know it looks that way to everybody, but I mean, you're just trying to, there's, a, there's always going to be the push and pull around, like, how do you move something forward? And there's a lot of it is context. Like, Diablo 4, um, by the way, June 6th, in case you didn't know, um, Diablo 4 <laughs> is, you know, it's been about 11 years between D3 and D4, and when you have a game that's had that sort of, you know, a lull in between like that, there's certain, you have to treat it differently than you would if you were doing an annual release where it was coming, a new game was every year. And so we had to look at, like, how do we pay homage to the past about what people loved about, I mean, it's a 27 year old franchise. And so what do people love about the past, but how do you push the genre forward or at least push our franchise forward? And so that's why we, you know, I always use this little simple equation of it's like the dark tone of D1 and it's the sort of the progression of D2 with the visceral combat of D3 and then the innovations of D4 with the, the, the open shared world and those sorts of things. And so we've had to prioritize across those to how much fan service, how much do we want to bring our core back and how do we want to, but we also have a lot of new players we have to. So now you can play on a PC with a controller and, you know, because a lot of console players out there too. So now we're shipping for the first time a Diablo game like at the same time on console. And so there's, there's sort of what the players expect that you have to have a prioritization of, what you kind of have to do to bring them along in that journey to be able to really, you know, realize what your, your, what your hopes are as a dev team. And, so that, and, and it's tricky because the hard part is sometimes the loudest voices are the smallest groups. <laughs> and so you're like... Wow, I'm getting a lot of feedback on this. And you go, like, and what I love about what Holly said around the data side of it is that there's often a perception that comes from the, the, the loudness that makes you think something that the data shows you it's actually different. And so it's, it's great to be able to go, like, I'm hearing a lot of this, and you go, like, oh, but the data shows that. And so I can actually do something for the majority as opposed to sort of being whipped around by the minority who are just very loud. And so 
that's that's the other trick now is that people have direct communications, you know. And that the first time I, I got on Twitter, I thought it was a bullhorn. I lo I literally did. Like Cliff tricked me to get onto Twitter. I'm like, I, it's a bullhorn, and I went, hey everybody, I'm on Twitter, and everybody, and then <laughs> all these replies, and went, oh crap, they talk back. Like I thought I was just yelling to people, and but because of that, if we do something like w what uh, Lydia said around, you know, if you make a a twist in the narrative that's not quite right, or you make a feature that's not quite right, or you're missing a quality of life that's not quite right you know on minute one because somebody's hit you on Twitter with it or hit you some, you know, like, and so that, that there's that sort of pressure and a great, and it's actually awesome to be able to have that interaction, but it's also tricky because again, oftentimes the loudest is the smallest. Yeah, yeah. In, in Guilt my chat world, for the internet. <laughs> in my world, we get to cheat a little bit too. So the um, question about uh, making the choices, making hard choices, prioritizing, um, we've made some cinematics that we've sat on before. As a matter of fact, we're sitting on one right now for Overwatch. We, you know, the, the game, the speaker before us was talking about how messy game dev is and it's unpredictable and timelines are, you know, often not what you expect. Um, and so we try to craft a plan and lay out a roadmap of what we think we're going to be doing. But in the pre-rendered world, you know, we need lead time. And so oftentimes we make cinematics to announce a game. We have one right now that we're sitting on for a game that wasn't quite ready to announce. So we're sitting on it. And then we have, um, you know, uh, shorts for characters for a game that aren't quite ready yet because something changed on the timeline of the game. The good news in my world, we can just set it off to the side and, and wait. Um, but yeah, sometimes we, we don't make, uh, we don't have the, the perfectly laid out plan because it's a messy process and you know we try to weave it all back together and then it looks like we had it all figured out from the beginning. She, she makes it sound so easy. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> it goes something like this. Lydia, I'm on Slack. Lydia, I'm in a, in a creative pitch and they want to change the, the, you know, the story set up for our next expansion. Uh, and she's, you know, what are you about, three or four months into... Six months in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, so, we, well, how much of a change are we talking about? Well, blah, 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 blah. I think we can make that work. Let me go check with my folks. And then there's, you know, there's human drama involved in it. But that's part of the fun and, and the cool factor, right, is, is as you get into your sandbox and you start, you know, setting everything up, you realize, oh, my gosh. This was awesome, but this could be even more awesome. And I think having that, that flexibility, and you know, I'm, we have such a, a great team, both in cinematics and on our dev teams, because they have become nimble. You know, they've had to learn to just you know, roll with it, chase new ideas, but still stay you know, focused. Yeah, that, that concept of um, deciding what you're going to work on, it's a central tenet to what we try to teach at Blizzard in um, game design. Uh, we have a value we call concentrate the cool, which is in the early days when we were small, um, we necessarily had to focus on what we were going to work on because we didn't have the resources to do everything. And so weirdly doing less often makes your game better because you concentrate on the most important things and you don't dilute your sort of resources. Um, we suffer from the opposite problem today. We do have the resources. Now we fly around in this big, beautiful Death Star. We can blow entire planets up. And sometimes um, doing too much actually uh, makes your game worse. And so trying to teach our, our teams to do less, to concentrate the cool. Steve Jobs used to say, um, saying no is about focus. And so sometimes um, that is a is a principle that we kind of try to teach to get our to make our games the core gameplay better. Yeah, it, I, it's I, it's more of a yellow submarine though, not a, not a Death Star. <laughs> okay, just so we're clear. I, I want to drill down on that a bit because of course you you work in so many genres now, right? So you just cited focus as one of the things that you you try to teach your design teams. What are the other principles that cut across genre? Because I think. In the industry, we, we typically see that teams get great at a genre, right? They specialize into it, they master it, they learn it. And, you know, when, when teams switch to doing something completely different, they often have to start learning. It's like learning dev all over again, right? So what, what are the things that you, you have in common across all of these franchises? Yeah, so that's... That's, I would say that the answer to that question is the secret to Blizzard's success. That's and what we want to hear. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. 
And so that's just actually a super long conversation. There's about a dozen core design principles that we focus on, and really there's many, many more than that. But if you go back to the early, early days, in our DNA is making lots of games and, and lots of different kinds of games. This is back when it took five people to make a game and dev cycles were six months. It was easy, you could do this at, you know, at very low risk and low cost, it was super fun. Um, but that's how we still think. And so when we think about design, cutting across genres, the first thing we teach is that um, making great games is part science, but it's also part art. And we give our teams a great amount of agency in what they do to innovate. That said, there are around a dozen principles. Um, I won't go over all of them today. I'll mention a few. Um, the truth is we could take any one of those principles and talk about it on a single one of our games for a whole day. So it would be months and months to have this conversation exhaustively. But some of them seem simple, like gameplay first. Um, in theory, simple. In practice, very, very complicated to execute because you have a lot of people pulling in different directions, all of them wanting to make your game amazing. And so, but we prioritize above everything else the core gameplay. And when you really unpack what that means, one of the things that we try to do is make our core gameplay appeal to as broad an audience as possible. In the early days, that meant what we think of sort of as mid-core and hardcore gamers. Um, today, that's very, very different. We think about how things have changed through time. Now there's casual gamers and global gamers and gamers of different ages. But some people, um, and I would say in the early days, the prevailing wisdom was you were either making a casual game or you were making a hardcore game. You weren't doing both. You couldn't do both. You had to choose an audience. And we rejected that notion. We said, we actually want everybody. Now, it's a bit of hyperbole, not everyone's gonna play your game, but it's the thought exercise. And the canonical example we talk about, we teach our young designers, is chess. Chess is a game you can teach an eight-year-old to play in about five minutes. It's actually very simple. There's only six pieces, piece types. Um, but then that eight-year-old can spend the rest of their life playing all day, every day. So depth of play, interesting play, is not synonymous with complexity. You can make something simple and still have it be deep. And if you can pull that off, well, now you can invite in a large audience. Once you've got your audience, though, and by the way, part of inviting a large audience in is what we talked about to, to start off, is that fulfilling the fantasy, right? You get them to pick your box up. Now you make the onboard easy. So make them feel great right from the beginning, make it easy, you know, work on your tutorials and work on your on-ramp. We didn't call it those sorts of things in the early days. And there's a fun story we tell about a, um, Lost Vikings watching a, a, a kid, he was probably 12 or 13, walk up to a bank of kiosks at Virgin Megastore and Lost Vikings was one of them and he paused and he looked at them and he went straight to Lost Viking. So we had fulfilled the fantasy. We'd captured him, our graphics, our color, our self-running loop. He picked up the controller, and the very first thing you had to do was just jump. We were trying to tutorialize jumping over a little pit of electricity. And so he, he didn't jump. He fell into the electricity, which is a super simple jump, died, put the controller down immediately, and went to the next game. So we're like, oh, God. we. We got him to that point, and then we lost him right at the beginning. So one of the other things we teach is everyone wants to feel heroic. You know, it's a metaphor again, but we play games to feel good about ourselves, to have fun, to escape, to feel powerful and heroic. In our own world, we're all the heroes, you know, of our own stories. So we try to teach people about that, you know, that onboard and letting, uh, letting your players feel amazing. And then, if you're going to build a game to stand the test of time, you've got to build it for that. Now, in the early days, that meant PvP, something like Warcraft. And so, while working on Lost Vikings and Blackthorn, what we were actually playing was Street Fighter and Samurai Showdown. And it turns out, you know, playing against other people is really fun. So there's a multiplayer component to it, super production efficient, because if your players are playing each other, they provide almost an infinite amount of content for each other. Um, that was Warcraft. Diablo, we did a little differently. We were still big fans, still to this day, of multiplayer, but we couldn't afford to make huge amounts of content. 
So Diablo was sort of procedural in nature. So you go back and you look at the roguelikes of the early days, Angband and Mariah and some of those others. We took inspiration from those. And you can play, you know, Diablo 1, 2, 3, almost infinitely. Um, they're smart from a system's procedural design. More recently, we have something like World of Warcraft, which is highly playable in that it lets you do lots of different things, group, solo, raid, PvP. Um, and that is a smartly built content team with the tools to make lots of great uh, content. So there's a lot of ways to make your game sort of playable over the long run. And that's something that we try to do with everything we do. We, we, ideally, we would have our games, we used to say this and it sounded silly at the time, but ideally our games would be played for 10, 20 years. And so when we said it, even we didn't really believe it. But today, it's actually kind of true. Starcraft is still out there, you know, Warcraft 3 is still out there. And so those are some of the, the things that we try to do. And when we think about what kinds of games we want to make next, that's kind of the lens, some of the lens that we're looking through. That, that's awesome. I, it, to, in some ways, right, there's this sort of accepted industry wisdom about, well, know your audience really precisely, aim straight just for that, right? And, and some of what you're saying does, aim, you know, it runs contrary to that. And personally, I like that, right? Um, you know, I, games are for everyone, right? And they should be for everyone. So. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the team and teams. Of course, games are built, especially games this size, are built by teams. Um, I, I guess I'd love to hear about how you structure the teams, uh, how you teach them these things, how you, you on-ramp them into this way of thinking. You know, you're, you're a big company now. That, that, that must be quite a challenge. How, how, do, you, how do you build these teams and this culture? Any of you, all of you, you know. Part of it's scale. I'll just, I'll talk about the scale part. Um, you know, it's one of the things that when you have a game that's gonna last, especially now with service, you know, games as a service, there's a, there's a moment in time when we've seen it in the industry before when a studio decides to go from being a one game studio to a two game studio. And I've seen studios collapse under that. Like they just can't make that, where do we get two sets of leadership and how do we give ownership and how does everybody feel like they're involved and all those sorts of things. And that kind of happens now at games as a service because um, the gravitational pull of the main game is really difficult to get away from when you're trying to do your prep for season one or your prep for expansion one or whatever else you're doing. And so that notion about what you have to do as a team to grow to be able to do those things in parallel. And so, you know, when we go through our plan and there's it's swim lanes of, okay, we need the main game and then we need season one swim lane and a season two swim lane, we need expansion one swim lane, we need expansion two swim lane. And those are all like different teams of different people. And you go from, you know, at the time, I've only been at Blizzard for three years, but we've more than tripled the team and oh, through the pandemic. And part of that is knowing like what's really changed is that the, that idea that games is a hobby, that, that consumptive nature of players, which they were before, but before they were consumptive of different games, would be like, saw the credits throw, saw the credits throw, saw the credits throw, right? And now it's like, what's the, the game I love? What does it keep doing for me? And if you're not there on week one to have a new thing for them, then they're like, oh, I don't know if this is the right thing. And so I think one of the challenges about having these sort of live service, live forever games is just that how you cross that tipping point from being the, I know everybody in the kitchen, to, wow, there's a lot of people here, to, hey, do I have the right numbers of people to do all the things that we're trying to do in parallel? And that's, that's been one of the big challenges for sure. Yeah, you know why we called it live when we, because I think we coined that at Origin um, when we launched UO. Our metaphor was actually a, um, a theater company. Mm. We said that the beta test was like, workshopping the play sure. and from now on it was live and it was you were doing the ongoing performances and on tour and so on and the cast members change and the stage manager changes and and you know over time it's ship of theseus right the whole the whole crew might go away and yet the play goes on the show must go on so anyway sorry no, uh, random historical it's anecdote great. there well, and, and, and hopefully Sometimes we're hopefully filling in some of that time with 
transmedia. So, you know, but, but that's also so prevalent right now, too. There is this expectation that, you know, between games, where's my TV show? Where's, you know, where's the comic series? What, what else are you, are you feeding us? So we've got all these dis different vectors that we're trying to stay on and constantly keeping up with that, that demand that Rod speaks of, of, you know, the need for content. And it's, it's real. People want a lot of it, and they want it quickly. <laughs> and, so it, and, and we've got these huge, amazing franchises, each of them having so much opportunity to explore. Again, that's what brought me to the company in the first place is there's not just one or two, there's four or five amazing places to go play narratively and explore. And how do you get it all done, right? Big teams. I, I, I think it, it bears mentioning, especially with, with the audience here, I've heard a lot of people pitching their ideas, and uh, you know, there's certainly a significant difference between when you're first taking that idea out there, trying to get your, you know, your seed money or however you're going to fund it. It's cool listening to Tim's talk. Um, and then the transition to actually developing and then you know, bringing this thing live. Because it, you know, I think that the team that you start with in the beginning, whether it's you or a small group of people, um, you've chosen them because they have they wear a lot of different hats. You know, they have that that ability to you know do the accounts payable and write a good you know dialogue script. You know, or as Tim said, when he had to you know do testing. And as the, as it gets more serious, and, and these days you know games get big pretty fast, teams get big pretty fast, more specialization starts to occur and you start looking for people that have the propensity to lead. And it's not always that same core of people that you know, we're good at throwing that pitch together. And it's important for everybody to recognize that and know how this thing's gonna evolve. Because that's usually a really tough transition point with a team is when it realizes, oh, we're, we're gonna go into production now and I've gotta pick a role. You know, or I've got to turn this over to somebody else that's a, that's a better manager so that I can just continue to write you know, the cool dialogue I want to write. And, and those are, that transition is one that either makes or breaks the team. You know, even if you've got the concept approved, I think that's the point where if people don't get it together and decide we're here to make a great product and we're going to put our egos aside and we're going to figure out where can we make the greatest benefit to this, and when they can make that transition, then the game goes into development. And a lot of what we're, just, you know, what we experience now, Blizzard, we're fortunate, you know, that Alan and, you know, people before, you know, did a lot of that hard work. And, and our job is to evolve, you know, these games to more modern audiences. But a lot of you are you're starting your very first game. So know that you're going to go through a lot of evolutionary steps before it becomes a live service and that becomes something that, that you have to worry about. I would say for me, coming into Blizzard, one of the magical things and, and what I think makes it successful and makes World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft, is I come from a production background. I'm schedule, schedule, schedule. Um, but what is... I don't like that summarization <laughs> of what production <laughs> I'm is. sorry. Easy. <laughs> she has this t-shirt that says I schedule on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the magical things about that I would advise is iteration. That is one of the secrets to World of War. Well, all of our games and all of the work we do is this idea of you put time in the schedule to make it better. And it's a significant amount of time because that's how we get to what we call blizzard quality. And it's an entire team effort. Everyone is looking at the content. Everyone is giving feedback. And it's this cycle that we get to in our alpha, I would say, into our beta. So I highly encourage everyone to take that seriously. It can make a big difference to the quality of your product. It's actually the biggest, like, I've, you know, I've been doing this for a while, too. And a lot of times you're trying to help bring that process with you where you go someplace. But the biggest like change that I saw would, that I had to get used to was this notion of soup tasting. And so at, at Blizzard, this idea of, hey, we're going to do this, these alphas and we're going to have this unallocated design time just to respond to that. Because the, the notion of the soup tasting is we're going to put it out there and it's kind of, you know, pseudo formal, you know, final form. And then you go like, oh, not enough salt, needs more carrots, you know, more broth or whatever. And then you may end up where you have to kind of fundamentally change something. And so we always had this notion of, okay, we're going to go do this test, but there's this block of time that's freed up for all the designers to deal with whatever is wrong. And <clears throat> that was one of the things for D4. Like one of our first alpha tests, we were like, we're missing an endgame feature. 
And so we, we ate up all that time to go f get a new end game feature that we knew could help the, the, once you're done with the campaign. But that idea of soup tasting was not, you know, my 20 years of game making, we've done similar, like, but not that to that degree. And so that idea of giving it a name and a f formality of like, okay, we're going into the soup tasting phase and so leave the designers alone. You know, they, were, they have unscheduled design time to deal with the feedback in the alpha. It was, it was a new thing for me. There's, there's a story that goes along with that. I just want Shocking. to interject, Jack, right? It's surprising. Tell you have it, a tell story it, right? to go for that. Come with me. I'll tell a story. <laughs> um, but people today say, well, yeah, that's fine. Blizzard, you, you, know, you can afford to do that. You can afford to take time to iterate, iterate, but smaller studios can't. And the truth of the matter is, back in the day, StarCraft, we were working unbelievably hard. Seven-day work weeks, 14-hour days to hit Christmas. Um, and we made the hard decision as young idealists to slip Christmas and ship it in, in spring, which was suicidal. And we didn't have the money or the time. It was a terrible financial decision, or so we thought at the time. And so it's the kind of decision that we as idealists could make, believing that that was a terrible financial decision, right? What we didn't know at the time was if what you're optimizing for is you know 20 year franchise value that's actually a super smart decision and so we we ended up missing that selling season but we know now that starcraft became a beloved franchise and that's a big part of why and so sometimes we'll say like the world doesn't need more mediocre games delivered on time that can be weaponized in a bad way and you know maybe we have a different problem today where you combine that with some of the quality of life conversations we have to find that healthy middle ground of maintaining quality of life while working hard, but when necessary, you know, soup tasting. We used to call it eating your own dog food back in the day, but soup tasting is a little nicer. <laughs> so we are almost out of time, but I, I did want to ask one last question, right? Because it's been around a, a long time, and these franchises have lasted a long time. And the world has changed around us in a whole bunch of ways. Games have changed. The audience has changed. You know, time has moved on. I have more gray hair. You know, I, so I'd, like to, I'd love to hear what are the adaptations? What are the challenges you see? What are the ways in which you see Blizzard needing to evolve, change, adapt? Right? What are, what are the big challenges in, in the the next mountains to climb. I, I can go real quick. Um, I think a couple of things, two things. Uh, one is diversity. I think at Blizzard, we want to be welcoming, globally welcoming. Um, and so <laughs> it's a commitment not within the team itself to be a reflection of the players who play the game, but also the content we make, very important to us. Um, the other thing is because, again, our goal is to welcome everyone into World of Warcraft, and part of that is I would appeal to you and all, all of my uh, fellow uh, Blizzard folks here, I have great concerns about a welcoming game in an era of toxicity, and I feel like as much as we can as a development community, we need to start, you know, trying to tackle this problem. It's very difficult, um, but I do see in our future, we're gonna have to try and meaningfully uncover solutions to those problems so that we are a welcoming escape um, for us, particularly in World of Warcraft. Yeah, I'd, I'd plus what Holly said there about, um, as we think about the kind of games we wanna make and the IPs we wanna craft going forward, um, things have changed dramatically over the last 30 years. And so that idea of being sort of um, globally welcome, welcoming, welcoming across uh, demographics, uh, including age, by the way, we see now younger game players are a force. So we talk about welcoming everybody into our games. Um, well, as, the, as the hard M game on the panel, I say like, <laughs> it's clear that games are for everyone, not every game is for everyone. That's right, a pantheon of games. Um, but yeah, making a game, so that makes the, the design of the game uh, more difficult, and the IP of the game. You see with Overwatch, it's a good example of a third gen sort of IP that 
invites in not just hardcore adult players or mid-core and casual adult players, but really for the first time in Blizzard's history, also uh, a younger audience. So that's one challenge. The other we've touched on is live ops. Live ops, if you're successful at all the things we've talked about, and you ship a great game that's, that's playable, um, and you get a big audience, that's just the start these days. It used to be that was you were done with the journey. Maybe you patch once or twice and you move on. But for us today, that's just the start. Our teams will triple or quadruple in size after we ship. And balancing the needs of live ops with trying to make the next new thing um, is a great challenge for us, as it will be for you know any company that ships a successful game that is highly replayable, that attracts a large sort of uh, audience. All right, well, I think we're out of time, but hopefully everybody took copious notes, can steal all your best tricks, and uh, yeah, here's to more Blizzard. Yeah, thanks, Raf. Thank you. Thanks, Raf. Yeah.